Sometimes life gives us lemons. Sometimes it gives us lemonade. Other times it gives us something entirely out of left field that makes us say WTF. But no matter what obstacles come, there is most often a way out on the other side and we are once again victorious. My name is Dr. Rowe. And you are listening to my podcast about resilience. Every guest shares a tragedy to triumph story to give listeners like you the inspiration to push through every single day. Listen now as my next guest shares how they were life jacked. What do you do when the time to give birth to your child turns into a physical or emotional experience of distress as opposed to a joyful or happy moment. My name is Dr. Rowe, and this is Life Jack, the Resilience Podcast. Life Jack is when an unfortunate or unplanned event happens to Jack with your life. My guest for this week, Trisha Fuller, Once a laboratory and x-ray technician, is now a successful business owner with multiple clinic locations and a vocational school. She is a master hypnotist, NLP practitioner, trainer, international speaker, and the director of Hypnosis for Health and Happiness and the Canadian Hypnosis Academy. Tricia is passionate about helping others achieve their goals and design their successful future with hypnosis and NLP skills with private online sessions, corporate training, and seminars and courses. Her inspiration and motivation stems from her own personal triumphs with hypnosis, quitting smoking, and hypnotic childbirth. These successes inevitably changed the course of her life. Trisha is excited to help you become the architect of your life and help you be as resilient as she is. Hi, Tricia. Welcome. Thank you so much for being a guest on my show. How are you? Excellent, Dr. Rowe. Thank you for having me on. How are you today? I am doing wonderful. Now, you have had some difficult birthing experiences, which we're both mothers and anyone out there who is a mother, you know, you're already scared going into, especially your first time giving birth because you don't know what to expect, right? You have no idea. Of course, people tell you all kinds of things, but it's still your own experience. So can you please share, and you've had not one, but two, and then even a third one, but we'll get to the third one later because the third one is a special one. But the first Mm -hmm. birth, can you share those experiences with the listeners? Yes, so that, you know, birth is incredibly, it can be scary the first time. And, and women have a history of notoriously telling each other the worst part about it. They, they don't ever really focus on the joyous part, but they, they focus on the problems. Um, and my first birth, I was in the medical field already. So I had like lots of nurses and doctors and other technicians who worked around me. And they all had an opinion about how I should be going about this. And because I was in the medical system, I just believed wholeheartedly whatever I was being told. And the irony is, you know, um, have you ever baked buns or muffins or cookies, Dr. Rowe? Not very well, but I've tried. (laughs) Right. So the truth is, is like, if you take buns out of the oven and they're not golden brown, they're going to be gooey and gross, right? Um, And the healthcare profession was telling me that because my child was 10 days over the estimated due date that she needed to come out because I was, of course, harming her by keeping her in. Like, it was my choice. (laughs) You know, I find it ironic now because it was like, it's not like you can change this. And statistically speaking, um, it doesn't really matter how many, how many times you've had babies, the actual Regular, like the average for the last hundred years is five days after the estimated date. So not even close to the estimated date, at least five days to 10 days after. So the reason it was is that they were telling me because she was overdue according to this arbitrary number 
that I had to go in and be induced. And once I was induced, then um, there was a series of interventions and reactions that happened that caused me to have essentially a cesarean. And then not only just a cesarean, but the none of the anesthesia works, so I had to be knocked out cold in order to have my first child. And I remember, you know, being knocked out going, oh, my gosh, I'm going to die and I'm never going to see her. Like, and I was, you know, it, it, I was shook, you know, because that's not how you plan to have your first child. And the second child, because of all the emotions that I had went through the first time and I never dealt with them, I was basically a ball of anxiety the whole time I was pregnant. And even though I made a lot of better choices, I tried to hire a midwife, and I did, I never dealt with the emotional content of it. And I never could see myself actually succeeding. So my poor second child, she she felt all the anxiety and she planted her feet upside down in my pelvis and said, I'm not coming out no matter how hard you try. And I did. I tried to turn her three different times. <laughs> and she was like, no, I'm staying here. And so I found myself the second time going, oh, I guess we're doing this again. <laughs> you know. And, and I was. I was told that because of the way she was presenting, I had to have a cesarean again. And even though it did go better, I felt, emotionally like destroyed not that I said anything and and my babies are blessings they they're beautiful and healthy and everything did work out okay and and by no means do I want to portray that I I regret those births but they definitely were the pivotal part that changed my world for forever and I know motherhood does that for everybody but the actually how they came into the world changed my perspective in such a dramatic way that I couldn't couldn't go back. Well, I totally understand that. Uh, my first, my oldest son was born natural, vaginal, you know, regular delivery. And then, of course, I experienced what you experienced. My second child, my middle son, uh, he was breech. And, you know, mm-hmm. he, of course, you all the advice, because I did. I kept saying, I, was like, I think he's stepping on my bladder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At the top of my stomach, there was this hard mass, and I was like, I feel like that's his head. I said, I don't, yeah. I don't think he's, you know, face down like he's supposed to be. Um, now, of course, lucky you, you got past your dude. I, my children seem to be in a rush to get here, so <laughs> <laughs> my children were born early. Uh, but yes, you know, it was just an odd thing, and you almost feel like not like a failure, right? Because you think, oh, it's natural that babies turn and they are positioned and they're supposed to be head down and you have the baby and here we go. But right. I do understand how you feel, but it's, it's unfortunate that someone else, you know, other people make you feel like you did something wrong, like it's your fault that the baby didn't turn. And yes, you try, if you have enough amniotic fluid, they try to turn the baby and all you try to do all kinds of things. People say, well, maybe you should stand upside down and maybe he'll flip back with all these crazy things, right? <laughs> Right, and it's like I literally did them all. Like, I, and I did stand upside down. I used flashlights. I used music. You name it. I had one person who who was very well meaning. When I finally scheduled the cesarean for the breach, they said, "Oh, it's about time you stop messing around with that child." And I was just like, "Wow, that's not very supportive." <laughs> this is supposed to be, you know, somebody who cares about me. And, they, and then, yeah, and, and there wasn't. It was just like, well, this is what you need to do. And, and, and here it is. This is your options, you know. <laughs> so it, it's very hard that you either agree with them or you're completely abandoned and on your own. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how, you know, you would think that their bedside manner would be immaculate and wonderful because it is stressful having a child because you just don't know which direction it could go, right? And it's so much going on at the time. Your body's doing all of these different things all at once, uh, and you just don't know, you know, what can transpire. And, you know, the, the fact that you would have a nurse or doctor or whoever is in the room with you, um, as you're going through this process and that they are not, or your midwife, and they're not sensitive to or empathetic to you. That's just, that's horrible. Horrible. Yeah. I mean, how does that feel? Um, it, you know, it, it wasn't even necessarily the doctors or nurses that were the hardest on my nervous system. It was like the people who were supposed to support me no matter what I decided. And I get why they, 
you know, made those statements, it like they, I, and I mean like closer family, of course, you know, I'm not going to say who, but it was, it was more like, um, it wasn't as unconditional as I wanted. I could brush off why they were that way, like hospital staff is that way because they're they're used to do it, doing it. They do it every day, right? It's normal for them. It's the the magic is lost on them. Um, but it, you know, it, it is. It's, it's very. It feels very unsupported in a time where you really do need like that community, that that uh, tribe of people to support you. It's interesting that you talk about the people who were supporting you and by your side and you know we're all supposed to have I mean we should have a support system right like your tribe as you said that are there for you Mm -hmm. can put the side for a moment and let it be about you so within your support system do you feel like you've had a good support system just aside from that time but you know what has your experience been like with having a support system (laughs) <laughs> you know, that is a very loaded question. And, you know, at the time, I I thought it was okay. But, like, retrospectively, um, I really needed more women who had succeeded naturally. I, I needed to step further out. And once I did st- start stepping further out, then I started to, you know, get more true stories of childbirth rather than just um, a medical procedure. Um, so what I mean by that is like the second childbirth, I, you know, hired a midwife and talked to doulas and started researching like what natural childbirth went, uh, was like, and even as far as like, if you Google natural childbirth, not Google, like a YouTube video, you know, you can find a person having a baby squatting in the middle of like a forest, you know, with, with no interventions whatsoever. And I, that, that kind of knowledge, knowing that we don't have to be, um, controlled, so to speak, when we're having children. Yes, there's a time and place for like acute uh, problems, but for the most part, we are built to succeed. And so, um, the biggest form of hypnosis, of course, is is media, and we are all indoctrinated from like a very young age through like even like comedy movies about what childbirth is like, which literally programs us the negative way to have a child. So when I talk about like not, I didn't realize I didn't have support. It was because I had net, none of that that good research in my head. I only had like whatever, you know, a sitcom or a movie had showed me, or you know, somebody who had a horrible story. And so I didn't have any resources of what like normal looks like or healthy delivery or anything like that. And then even as I progressed, you know, if if we fast forward into when I like launched my career and stuff. My immediate family was like very supportive, but like, I'm from a very small town, and they were like, "Oh, you're opening a hypnosis business? <laughs> Are you crazy?" You know, like so. Yeah, you know, I feel like the support has has I've had to learn to chase finding the right people to be in my tribe. It's not always the, the people that you're right around. You have to search for what you need, and you have to yeah, you know, back to the resiliency factor. Like, if you don't believe you have it, you need to look in different places and you can't just look in the same places you've always looked, but it is out there. You just have to, you have to open your eyes and, and see a more peripheral view of the options around you. The medical advice or the common practice in the OBGYN community states that once you have a C-section, then you must have C-sections for all subsequent births. I know that was told to me that my third son, he definitely had to be born by C-section. It was scheduled. I mean, there was no, even there, even though there was time had passed, right, between my middle son and my youngest. I mean, there was, there was eight years <clears throat> in between them. But I was told, nope, you've got to have a C-section. But you pushed back on that and had a vaginal delivery with your third child. What That's right, you- yeah. What gave you the courage to do something different, to go against the grain? Uh, there was like an innate feeling within me that my body could succeed. Like I, I really wanted to prove that I wasn't broken. I don't know, you could call it a positionally defiant or whatever, but, you know, <laughs> I, I was like, it, like, I really, I knew that it wasn't like a 100% rule. Like, I knew that the medical system set has, like, little caveats type of thing on it. Um, 
and it's just really challenging to find that healthcare provider that will support you. And so again, when I went with the, the midwife route, they had to do some research on like how the cesarean was performed and how the closure procedure was done and, and these kind of things which are really important for scar tissue. Um, and once I met all those marks and they agreed that I could try, and of course try is always in quotation marks, um, especially if you're in a hospital. I had a midwife who had been blessed with 12 children of her own, and she had hundreds and hundreds of babies that she had helped come into the world, and she really believed in me more than I did probably from the beginning, and that, and that was the first thing, when, and that kind of does go back to that tribe thing. I hired a person who really believed in me, and then I started to go down the journey of healing, and the journey of healing for me was knowledge and hypnosis and um the two of them have to go together the second on my second birth i had tried to do like a version of hypnosis it was it wasn't very involved and it was very very small in comparison but i found a program called hypno babies and um it is it is an amazing program and it didn't there was no instructors in in alberta and canada where i'm at um, but there was a home study course, so a five-week home study course, very in-depth, several hypnosis sessions, as well as complete prenatal education. And what I learned from that empowered me so much. Like, so like knowledge is power. I absolutely believe that. But what I was educated in was like proper childbirth or childbirth mechanics, like silly things like if you're in a squat the vaginal canal decreases by several inches, which just makes the, the course that the baby has to travel so much shorter. Or like if you lay on your back, you're putting pressure on your tailbone, which will increase the, the pain and make it so the baby can't come out because the bone actually pushes against their head. Whereas if you turn the body even just 45 degrees, that sacrum and tailbone uh, are free to move. So just like different things like that, like so body mechanics, as well as the hypnosis for childbirth and the hypnosis for childbirth empowered me to believe in myself again, because I needed to basically start from scratch. Even though I was good at other things, I wasn't good at this. So it empowered me to believe that I could see uh, succeed. And, you know, one of the fundamental things that I remember them teaching is something called changing your what ifs. And I still use this in, my, in, in business today like most people who go into childbirth, they use their what ifs like this. What if I need a cesarean? What if I need an epidural? What if I need to be induced? What if I need, and, and then what ifs never are about success. They're about fears. But the problem is, is the mind pictures those words. So for instance, if I say, don't think about a dog, I just made you think about a dog. So if you say, don't think about a cesarean, or I don't want a cesarean, you literally just made a picture in your mind. And that's like putting in an order in a restaurant. And so then I was able to change those what ifs to what if I have my, my baby comfortably? What if I have my baby in a peaceful place? What if I succeed and I feel empowered? You know, so I, I was able to use what they were teaching and put it into my everyday life not just for childbirth, but for, for everything, being a better mother, being a better wife, being a better employee. You're so enriched in this program and you're, it's so a part of you that it actually just, it just seeps into every other aspect of your life. And it was, it was beautiful. It was like magic. And I did. I succeeded at having a natural childbirth with zero interventions on the floor of my midwife's house because the hospital was full and it was beautiful. And I, I'm not going to say that it was completely comfortable. That was never my goal. My goal is to succeed. But um, I, I've had lots of students and clients who I've taught who have actually had a completely comfortable childbirth. So there's that. <laughs> wow, that is amazing. What advice would you give any pregnant mother who is thinking of using a midwife or doula for their childbirth experience? Absolutely, because it's like hiring uh, um, a person who is specialized. So, for instance, an OBGYN isn't specialized in natural childbirth. They're specialized in complications and anatomy and, and issues. But a midwife is specialized in natural childbirth. It's just like a pediatrician is specialized in children. 
right? This is a, they're specifically trained only for that. And it takes you to the next level because they have so much experience in what you're chasing. So if you want a natural childbirth, and even if you want it to be in the hospital, having a person who knows exactly what is normal and how to stimulate you normally in order for you to facilitate yourself to succeed, then I would say absolutely do it. And the more support you can have, I mean, I I love our husbands and partners dearly. However, they're not a woman who's gone through it. They don't, couldn't possibly know what it's like having somebody on your side and most doulas and midwives, I'm not going to say all, but a lot of them are, are females. They know it better because they've either seen it or done it themselves or a combination of both. So experience Trump knowledge. And I think that, that, that just makes you feel so much safer and so much more secure going into something that is unknown, especially for your first time. Now, what prompted the decision to become a hypnotist? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, <laughs> so, you know, I've talked a lot about, like, even just, like, little word changes and things that I had, were, was taught in that, that hypnosis for childbirth course. So once I went back to work in the medical system, I started to discover how much the words weren't matching what they wanted the patients to do or how much people weren't healing even though, you know, they were being treated. And, and how people phrase it has a huge, huge component to whether they're going to be successful in healing or achieving whatever they need. And so this, I started to do more research, but I kept on getting more upset the more I went to work because it feel, felt like it was doing harm to me. And not, and not that any, anybody was saying anything particularly bad. It's just it was hard to unknow what I had learned. And so then I started becoming very passionate about taking more. So I, I started with that course that I took, and I became the first instructor in Alberta for the Hypno Babies program. And then once I learned about that, like I learned it and became it and started working with people in childbirth, and I'm like, I became like a sponge. I just, I couldn't soak up enough information about hypnosis. And so then I became, you know, became a hypnotist. And then, I, you know, after a couple of years, then I found an organization that I became a trainer with and then, you know, opened a vocational school. And it just became, it was like a snow, a beautiful, beautiful snowball, but it just, once you know it, you can't unknow it. And um, my children often say to me, are you using hypnosis on me? And I'm like, I don't, have, I don't know how not to. After 14 years, it's, just, it's, part of, it's part of my words, my language. Hypnosis is happening or rather suggestion is happening all around us all the time. And helping people understand the words that they say and how they say them actually have power for people in a good or po- negative way, just depending on how it is used and helping educate people with to change that internal dialogue or external dialogue is, is profound because all hypnosis is actually self-hypnosis. You're doing it to yourself. Well, that's what I, I want to find out because, of course, most of us, our vision or our <laughs> – when we think about <laughs> hypnosis, it's just you're, you're getting very sleepy and, you know, someone snaps and they say sleep and then people mm-hmm. sleep or whatever up and then like I don't want to smoke anymore you know I mean like or, you know whatever I don't want to drink anymore or mm-hmm. you know they have the move where um you know or there is swinging some type of pendulum object you know or a watch or you know something on a chain in front of you and you're following it back and forth um you know there's the Mercurian candidate and then the movies get out and office space and carry and all these movies right which have like these mm-hmm supposed telekinetic powers or these people who are under the influence, right? So for those of us who do not understand hypnosis, please educate us and explain how hypnosis works and what the most common, of course, I've named a couple of misconceptions about it, but, you know, truly a couple of the myths that you would love to dispel to make us feel more comfortable and educate us. Right. Okay, I'm going to start, like, super simple and obviously, you know, if you feel comfortable, you don't have to do this, but like, go ahead and close your eyes and then open your eyes. And that's a lot like hypnosis. You shouldn't expect a blackout. You will be able to hear and understand. And like I said before, all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. So you're always in control 
Um, yes, uh, hypnotist facilitates the change, but the person wants to go into the state. The person wants to achieve something. So um, the definition of hypnosis is essentially the ability to focus on one thing to the exclusion of everything else. Now, when the term hypnosis was coined, hypno means sleep in Greek, but they wish it was never called that. But it, once they realize what it is, what it, what it is is called monoideism, which means singular thought, so achieving singular thought. And once they wanted to change that, of course, hypnosis was like way easier to say. And it already kind of stuck, you know, and it sounded a little bit more dramatic than, you know, a fancy word. But that is what it is. So, like, Dr. Rowe, have you ever driven somewhere, got there, and not remembered the last five minutes of the drive? Absolutely. It is the scariest thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, I don't recommend it, but it is highway hypnosis. You didn't black out. You were just, like, hyper-focused on one thing. You could have been thinking about what you were going to make for supper, or you could have been just, like, zoned out and just staring at the highway. But you you were still conscious. You were still aware. And if somebody would have said something to you, you would have snapped out of it. That is achieving that singular thought. Another example could be, like, um, uh, where does this jingle come from? Bum, 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 bum. The McDonald's jingle. I'm loving yeah. it. I can finish. Yeah, and <laughs> I am terrible at singing, and that still came across online. You know, like that's that's crazy. But that happens through that happens through relaxation, repetition, and fixation. You'll never not know that. That is hypnosis: repetition, wow. relaxation, and fixation. Another example that you know most people would have ex- experienced would be. Um, Like if you've ever cried in a movie or laughed in a movie, the movie's not real. It just makes your nervous system feel that it is real, so you have an emotional response. Wow. Yes, I've had a couple of movies that I just start crying and bawling, and I'm like, yeah, I don't even know these people. I don't even need their characters. (laughs) You know, but (laughs) you do feel it just so closely on just uh, just such a, that, like, immense and intense, emotional level so yeah I, I've had that experience as well I my I, I, yeah. I'm a, I'm a <laughs> when it comes to yeah. movies right so it means it means you're suggestible suggestible enough to believe that they will that, that they are true that they are real now when people hear the word suggestible they get a little bit freaked out because it was like oh something anybody's going to do something to me because I'm gullible or something like that no because hypnosis happens because of uh, like a leverage point of what a person needs to accomplish so say a person really needs to lose weight or reduce their stress or um, sleep or um, stop smoking. The more they want it, the more they will let the hypnosis work. So nobody can be hypnotized against their will. Those people are coming to a hypnosis because they want to achieve something. If they don't want to be hypnotized, they wouldn't be there. So will and ability and um, the suggestibility has to do with the factors of actually wanting the change. So the hypnosis will be deeper and more profound the more the person actually wants it because that means they're actually congruent with what they want to have happen. And you incorporate neuro, neuro-linguistic programming, which commonly is called NLP, into your hypnotherapy session. So what are the benefits that it brings to your clients? Oh, my gosh. NLP is so much fun. Here, I'll give you an easy idea of it. Um, have you, do you ever have a, like a messy cupboard or a messy desk drawer or something like that? Yes, I have a horrible junk drawer in my kitchen. <laughs> right. And you can take it all out and you can put it back in and you won't have gotten rid of anything, but it just feels better, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. And it looks, it looks better. And it's almost like you can find everything better. So with NLP, you can literally like help yourself move where things are stored in your mind so that they feel less potent to you. It's so quick and it's so easy. It doesn't require the close your eyes, never like, you know, it's a different type of technology. And the truth is, is one hit, a hypnotist and a neurolinguist, what, they won't really know where one ends and one begins. And we'll dovetail them both together. So we'll use a hypnosis like induction, but then we'll do an NLP technique that helps them change how they, they associate with a word or a feeling or an emotion. And then they will use the hypnotic technique to reinforce it on the back end. So sometimes we do them live and in, in, in just in conversation. 
um, even hypnotic conversation can happen that way. But the live techniques with NLP are so profound because it, it, it helps them bypass the critical faculty, so to speak, in fun and uh, curiosity in, a, in a, such a magical way that it doesn't feel quite the same. Like, for instance, many people have a, a negative belief system about themselves, and they'll, they'll see it in time and space in, in, in uh, maybe in front of them. But it's something that's like usually the picture is fairly clear. It also has an association in, in their body. But then if you think of something random like, um, did you used to believe in Santa Claus, Dr. Rose? I did. I, at least I believe I did. <laughs> yeah, right. But it's not useful to you anymore, right? Like you don't believe in it currently. Right, right. I love the movies, right. though. <laughs> About yeah, <Santa> right. <laughs> exactly. We all love the idea of magic. But, for instance, if you can change the location of a negative thought and memory to where Santa Claus is, and actually move that in your mind's eye and store it in a different place, kind of like how you put like your old toys away. You put that idea away in a different place in your mind, then all of a sudden it has no potency anymore. That is what we can do with NLP. Change things, and it can be done super fast, like in a matter of minutes. It's quick, it's easy, it doesn't require any analysis, and in fact, it's better if you don't, if you have fun with it, like a game. So I have to ask you, is there a person who is like the best candidate? Is there a certain type of person or that you need to be or to be oh, a yeah. candidate? Yeah. That, or, that's or is there something you're not going to work that's, on? <laughs> well, that's a great question. So for instance, like if a person is trying to prove to me that they cannot be hypnotized, then they can't be. <laughs> like if, if that's their whole goal is to prove that they can't be hypnotized, then they won't be. Because all hypnosis is self-hypnosis, you're always in control. So what I do offer is something called a free screening. Because people are like, I don't really know if hypnosis is right for me. And I really recommend anybody who is looking to do hypnosis, they always attend some kind of free consultation. Make sure the hypnotist does like a test with you to actually make sure that you're a good hypnotic candidate. If you're not a good hypnotic candidate, they'll tell you. Now, in a screening, that's a very small percentage because if they've already come in, they've proven that they want the help and it's something within scope of practice of hypnosis, then they're probably a good candidate. But that hypnotist has the opportunity to have a conversation with them and make them feel safe and or vice versa, right? So the hypnotist needs to be, you need to be comfortable with the hypnotist and they need to be comfortable with you. And then you do this test to see if you're a good candidate and then, and then you know for sure. So anybody who's just saying, oh, yeah, I'll just do hypnosis on you, uh, I'm, you know, I would, even I would be a little bit worried. I'd be like, mm, I think I need to know more information, right? So having somebody, you know, give a little bit of education, kind of like I talked about, like, for the prenatal education, having that information and knowledge component before I was even tested for hypnosis made it that much more powerful. So that's what I provide for the clients. Um, and, and there's lots of hypnotists that do this as well within the Master Hypnotist Society. We, we make sure that you actually know what hypnosis is. We kind of debunk all the myths and answer those questions and then actually make sure you feel comfortable enough to do hypnosis uh, with us. And then those people are highly successful because you've, you've kind of like weeded out anything that, that isn't, shouldn't be there um, and, and some of the reasons have nothing to do with the, the person themselves. It has to do with uh, requiring, for instance, a medical referral. So um, pain management clients, we can offer a sheet that can be signed by their doctor because we'd want to make sure they're actually medical, medically cleared to decrease that pain. Because if it hasn't been diagnosed, then that would be doing uh, harm, harm to the client. Um, same with some mental health issues. We work very closely with uh, doctors and psychologists making sure that this is the right modality for that client. I know you've helped many, many clients. So could you mm -hmm. maybe share a particular memorable success story from your practice where hypnosis absolutely made a significant difference in someone's life? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's so many. There's one that I'm still working with. I've been working with this, this lady for over a year. Uh, she came to me with extreme anxiety and weight loss. And it was one of those ones where I had to ask for a doctor's referral. 
uh, and no problem. Her doctor signed off on it because she was literally not wanting to leave the house. Uh, she couldn't hardly function. She just wanted to be in bed all day. She wasn't sleeping. She would either binge eat or not eat at all. Um, the list was like she she was literally becoming like a recluse because the outside world um, it was daunting to her. Yes, she could go to her job, but she wasn't functioning at it very well. She couldn't provide the help that she needed. It was, and the only solution that was being given to her was to give her more medications. And she kind of felt like a, a walking zombie, and her stress levels just kept going up. Um, after the free screening, I taught her a trick, even just in the free screening, that changed her life. It was just a very simple technique about uh, changing how she felt in the moment by using a technique called the, the milking motion. And she just, she just messaged me the other day. She got in a car accident. She started doing this technique. She phoned the insurance company. She phoned the police. She, she solved everything. And then it wasn't until hours later and she's like, oh my God, I got through this and it, it wasn't even an issue. Like I, I functioned actually better than the other person, you know, but it was like, it was a technique that she learned for free and she, you know, she was like, that's amazing. And because she changed so much, even just in the free screening, she was like, oh my gosh, this is so neat. She did a pro, like a more of a, uh, kind of a, like a mentoring slash, um, life coaching type program, but involved hypnosis and NLP. And, and now she, she's been on interviews uh, with me, like on TV. No, she never would have done that before. She, she's done radio ads. She's, she's lost 40 pounds. She's off all of her medication and she's, she's still moving forward. She's like continuing to use the skills that she's continuing to be accountable with me to plan the next steps of her, her world. Now, some people do that in like five sessions and some people do it in a larger program like she's chosen to do, but she wanted to do more of a whole whole life change. So, yeah, that's like one of the most powerful stories is she went from highly medicated living in, a, in her room, not doing anything, to now succeeding, chasing the life she wants, you know, smiling, eating right, moving her body, feeling amazing, and, you know, she's up for promotions and... She's, she's really creating the life that she wants through this technology. Wow, that is absolutely amazing. And, you know, kudos to you for taking on this work and helping people out. I mean, it's just, you know, this work is very interesting to me, but it, it, it seems like there's wonderful benefits for people, um, and it can really do amazing things. Now, I want to ask a question. It may sound like a crazy question. <laughs> but <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> That you yourself as a hypnotist, right? So can you hypnotize yourself? Or how does that work? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because like I said, all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. So within the first like five to eight sessions, I will have taught a person how to hypnotize themselves. So actually learning how to do the technique, because it is just a brainwave state there's a series of steps that you can go through to make it happen faster and easier. And for some people they can do it, excuse me, in a minute and a half and other people, you know, take a little bit longer, but that was the key thing that we learned in hypnosis for childbirth is how to hypnotize ourselves because the hypnotist doesn't come, come with you to your birth. So you have to learn how to get yourself in state immediately whenever you feel a contraction coming on type of thing. So yes, the answer is yes, absolutely. And in truth, um, all of us are in a state of hypnosis when we're talking to ourselves in our head. Um, and it's often it's negative hypnosis. So teaching people how to use their words and their language to benefit them rather than to prevent them from taking action or prevent them from feeling safe and confident, that, that is what we're helping people do. So we're learning how to use self-hypnosis in the moment, every day, and calling yourself out on the things that you're doing so that you actually can become that architect of the life that you want to create. Man, that's really, really neat. Now, in your opinion, what are the best ways to build resilience? <laughs> you know, um, it's knowing that you set your goal. Uh, resilience begins with the end in mind. So, uh, you know, that's, that's quoting Stephen Duchovny for, like, the seven habits of highly effective people. 
we begin with the end in mind. So the analogy that I use is like if your life or anything that you want to accomplish, imagine you open up like an app on your phone for maps, like Google Maps. Right now you are just a blue dot scrolling around on the screen. You have to type in the destination in order to auto-populate at least three routes on how to get there. Now, once you get going, you know, and I tell people, tiptoe if you must, but you, you have to start following that route, but you're beginning with the end, knowing the destination you're going, and inevitably, you will end up hitting road construction, or you'll get a flat tire, or you'll hit a detour, and you have to reroute, but that map keeps on auto-populating on how to get to that final destination. So that's something called reverse engineering. So you're beginning from the outcome backwards. So if a person has succeeded, and in this day and age, you can find out how a person has succeeded on almost anything. If it has been done once, it can be done again. That is the structure of genius. That is the structure of NLP. Using the model of a person who has already succeeded, if you emulate or model that person, you don't have to recreate the will. Nothing can be recreated. Nothing is new <laughs> anymore. You know, it's already been done before. You can follow that map or you can follow that, you know, if it, you're pretending that you were in a play, you can follow that script for that person who's already succeeded. And you can kind of take yourself out of the qu- equation and you know you already have the structure for how to succeed. So always begin with the end in mind. And then even if you just take a little step, just, just even a tiptoe in the right direction, you're heading in the, in the direction that you need to be. You can always change your destination halfway, but you need to focus on the, on the outcome, the final part, instead of just thinking of the next step. Always see, hear, and feel. If you've got your goal, what would that look like, sound like, and feel like? That is the structure of genius that makes your mind explode with possibilities and it gives you a happy mood or a state to imagine that instead of anything else. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Well, Tricia, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you. Please take the time to let everyone know how they can contact you if they are interested in a free session or if they're ready to go all in and get hypnotized or if they're, in fact, actually interested in becoming a hypnotist themselves. Oh, absolutely. So the easiest way to find me is at learnhypnosis.ca. On there is a contact form. Um, And for any of the listeners, they can get the free gift. So if you put your name in the contact form and say free gift and mention where you heard me from, say you heard me on Life Jack with Dr. Rowe, then I'll send you a free gift. Um, And then we can set up something called a free screening to see if you're a good candidate for hypnosis or for hypnosis training or NLP training. Or if you'd like to organize, say, a four-day course or retreat for people that you know, Learning these skills can be the easiest and fastest way to transform your life in a very uh, small amount of time. So some people who would like an opportunity to get away, we organize a retreat and they can have four days like with work or whatever. Um, and they work on themselves and they learn the skills in a short period of time. And that's where real a powerful change happens. So if you aren't an online person and you want to do something like that, that that's an op- option as well. So again, that's learnhypnosis.ca. My name is Trisha Fuller. I'm also on um, social media, specifically that's for Facebook or LinkedIn. And you can reach out to me any way that that you come across from there. But learnhypnosis.ca is the easiest and fastest. Any last words of encouragement for the listeners? If you have an outcome or something that you want to change, Know that you can succeed. You just need a a small series of tools. Very, like, three sets of tools can change your life. And I know a lot of people are always looking for, you know, a 180-degree change. I want to put my life in a different direction. And remember that one small change 
can change that degree and you will be heading in a different direction. One degree of change can make that happen for you. And if you need help, reach out. Find that person that resonates with you. Make sure that you have that opportunity to do any kind of like free screening or assessment or consultation with them. And then move forward and, and chase your goals, chase your outcomes, and help yourself to become the architect that you desire to be for your own life. Well, Tricia, I wish you and your family nothing but blessings and abundance. Please take care. You too. Thank you so much, Dr. Rowe, for having me on. It's, uh, it's been a beautiful chat. Thank you. Have a beautiful day. You have just listened to Life Jacked, the Resilience Podcast with your host, Dr. Rowe. Subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Pandora, Spotify, and any other podcast streaming platform. Remember to live, laugh, love, learn, and then repeat. See you in the next episode.